Well, good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day in Southern California. Kind of sucks we can't take him to the parks or anything right now. He really misses that. He does get to play with dogs here and there, but not quite like going to the park. All right, guys, I hope you're doing well today. So what I want to do is actually last night I went down the rabbit hole of watching one of my all-time favorite shows, The Larry Sanders Show, starring Gary Shandling. And, um, and it's just got some of the greatest characters of all time. It was just really well-written, well-directed. Hank Kingsley and Artie are some of the greatest characters on television, in my opinion. And I decided, you know, I wanted to go out and see that historic house of Gary Shandling's. It was known throughout the comedy community that he used to have a fight club style basketball game every week that nobody really told what happened there but all these famous comedians would constantly go out there week after week and play these basketball games so I went out last night to see the house and when I saw it I said you know I better bring my camera back today and vlog it for you guys before it's too late so that should tell you a little of something what we're gonna see when we get out there so I hope you're a Gary Shandling fan I'm a huge Gary Shandling fan really really fascinating comedian and I'll tell you about him once we get out there Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. All right, we're heading off to Gary Shandling's Brentwood house. He did have another house in Encino for quite a few years, but this one he actually had built himself and oversaw the whole building process, and there's a whole story behind all the changes that he ended up constantly making and why. I'll tell you about when we get out there. Not very often you see the 405 this empty. So as we make our way down to Gary's property, our former property at the end of this cul-de-sac, you'll notice that this property has been bulldozed and being rebuilt. There's a sign on this one right here, on this gate, says that one's gonna be demolished. You can see right there the notice of demolition. And then Gary's property is right here. I believe this is gonna be demolished as well because you notice that the side wall over here is completely gone. This would have been his entrance. Completely overgrown. And like I mentioned, he oversaw the entire building of this whole property. One of the I guess kind of funny stories that he was always searching to find who he was and he could never really commit to a woman. He That was one of his big complaints was never feeling like he could, you can see it's falling apart, the shingles and everything are old. Man, it's an, one acre of property. I'd love to go down the hillside that's where his there was like a path that took you down into his famous basketball court he used to have all of his comedy friends come over and play basketball all the time in fact I saw a thing where they said like the original gate and everything this was always open propped up by a rock any anytime his friends would ever come here it was always like open door but yeah he was always battling to find out who he was and part of that was he just always had a problem with commitment and he had a longtime girlfriend Linda who was on the Larry Sanders show and when they were building this uh, one of his friends came over and said she was wearing an engagement ring which was very shocking because he had just stayed up all night talking with Gary about them probably breaking up <laughs> and so he said that they had an agreement that Linda said you know um, well we're gonna move in here together when it's finished and then we're going to get married and so because of that they said every time i would go over there to see how the building was going the chimney would be moved or a wall would be moved or something would be changed that had originally been agreed upon man you can tell it looks like people have broken in over here but i wouldn't recommend it they have a uh, a camera right over here pointed at the house so i'm going to behave myself completely 
Gary Shandling was raised in Tucson, Arizona, a Jewish boy in Tucson. He constantly joked about that saying, you know, there were no Jews in Tucson and he was really smart. His parents were great parents. They had great senses of humor and, um, and he said that that was kind of where he got it. Unfortunately, he had a lot of sadness in his life early on because he had a brother named Barry who had cystic fibrosis and eventually over the years, it got worse and worse and Barry ended up living in like a, like one of those bubbles. And eventually they never told Gary that he died, but Gary figured out that he died. Wasn't even allowed to go to the funeral because his mom didn't want him to see her cry. <sighs> you know, sad as that. He said one day he was just not talked about anymore. And Gary kind of fell into the doldrums because of that, obviously, as you can imagine. And he kind of fell into liking comedy. He got into listening to Mel Brooks routines and he liked Jack Parr and Steve Allen. Kind of started fantasizing maybe someday being a talk show host and ended up enrolling in University of Arizona in an engineering department and said it was really hard. It was really hard even though he was extremely smart and extremely advanced. After a few years of it, he said one day I just, I just stopped. I just said, is this what I want to do with my life? And I didn't. I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. And he said I would realize that would become a pattern I would have throughout my life is whenever I would come to a point where I felt like, is this what I want to do? I would just stop completely. So he switched majors and enrolled in business and he said it was so easy in the business program that he was doing that he started like having time to come up with comedy routines and writing jokes and things. And he went and found out about George Carlin performing in Phoenix about two hours away because there was no comedy club in Tucson at the time. So he drove there, brought all of his notes of comedy that he had written. He had actually written bits for George Carlin and uh, gave those bits to George upon meeting him. And George said, okay, come back tomorrow. I'll read them and I'll tell you what I think. And he said the next, he actually drove all the way back to Tucson two hours. The next day he drove back and George Carlin had all of Gary's notes laid out and was going through them and said, look, you're green. You know, you have a lot to learn, but every page has something funny. And if you're asking me if I think you should pursue a career in comedy, I'm telling you, I think you should. So Gary eventually started working up comedy routines and trying to do something and then moved to Los Angeles where his life would completely change. So once Gary made it to Los Angeles, he started taking comedy writing classes and improv classes and met someone there who passed along some of Gary's writing to someone who was a writer or for was working for Sanford and Son. And they took a look at Gary's script and said, you have some good ideas here, but I can't pass this along. It's just not good enough. And so Gary got some help with it from a friend, turned it back in and they said, this is the best outside script we've ever had come into the show. So Gary's first gig in Los Angeles was writing three episodes of Sanford and Son, but he realized then that he hated doing the same thing constantly. And so he said, I even asked people on the set, like, how do you, like, how do you write for this show all the time and not get bored? I, I'm doing three shows and I, I'm already kind of tired of it. And they said, oh, you're getting burnt out already. But Gary didn't even have a, an agent yet. He was writing three episodes of Sanford Sun right across the hall on the same lot. They were filming Welcome Back Cotter. So he made a spec script, took it over there, showed it to them. They liked it, they bought it. And then he went and pursued getting an agent and that agent started getting him all kinds of writing gigs. But over time, Gary would realize that once again, is this what I want to do with my life? Do I really want to be a writer? And so he had went to the comedy store a couple of times, sat in the back and watched other comedians and decided that was what he wanted to do. He wanted to challenge himself to become a performer and it would be a lot easier said than done. Now the reason I say that is because Gary was a writer and when he would perform, Mitzi Shore, who ran the comedy store, would say that. You're not a comedian, you're not a performer, you're a writer. And she just didn't, she didn't treat the two the same. And in her mind, writers shouldn't even be wasting her time on her stages. And Gary fought back and forth. He 
kept journals actually once he started doing stand-up comedy he kept journals of his growth because most of that was just trying to figure out who he was as a person and through comedy if he documented night after night he could kind of start to figure out through all of his faults and questions of himself and fears and and everything he could kind of start to figure that out and he would document in there how much he hated Mitzi early on but over the years he became a very solid performer and one night Jim McCauley who was the booker for the Tonight Show was in there watched one of Gary's sets after years of performing and said you know what I'm gonna come back and see you again next week because I gotta make sure this wasn't a fluke Gary said that the whole audience was laughing. It was just one of those nights where everything clicked. It was the perfect time of the day, you know, perfect crowd, perfect everything. And he said, I didn't know that that could be reproduced. And then the net following Tuesday, when he came back, I did exactly the same thing with the same crowd response. And he said, you're going to be on the Tonight Show next Tuesday. And that really had become all that Gary had wanted out of his career. Once he had started planning on being a performer, that was the pinnacle was to do the Tonight Show. So Gary got his shot on The Tonight Show and he killed it. He did so great that he had taken Bob Saget there with him and afterward they were hugging and he started crying and he said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. I've done The Tonight Show, what do I do now? And Bob said, you do it again, you keep doing it. And originally Gary kind of thought maybe that's what he wanted to do was eventually be the host of The Tonight Show, but he would basically have a career boost from The Tonight Show like everybody did and he would end up going and opening for various huge performers in Vegas and really raking in a lot of money meanwhile having this comedy act of him never being sure you know what he was in life or if he would ever find a woman you know it was just always his self-doubt and his comedy was always based around the self-doubt. So Gary even though he was a comedian and a writer and pretty much everything, he took being an actor seriously and he took acting classes from one of the greats, Roy London. And Roy London really taught him how to look beyond a character into all the motivations and all of the personality and all of the relationships that that person would have with everyone in what they were working on and really brought something different out. So Gary really had a unique outlook on what he wanted to do if he was going to do a TV show because originally he had started getting asked to guest host The Tonight Show. Once Johnny had had kind of his falling out with Joan Rivers, he had made Jay Leno and Gary Shandling his two guest hosts. So Gary was doing that and was doing great at it and then got an offer from CBS to do a show, didn't like what they wanted him to do. And so Showtime said you can do anything you want and he signed on to do a show with Showtime. So once Gary had signed on to do It's Gary Shandling's Show, he wanted to make it very unique and very much him. So what he did was he had been making these little like spoof shows with Mike Nesmith from the Monkees at, at Post Monkees. And um, in these little vignette things, he would be talking to the camera. and. Gary always loved that when he saw Woody Allen do it, so he incorporated that into the show where it would be this kind of off the wall show and Gary would constantly be breaking the fourth wall. And that's how I found out about him. I would always be waiting to watch Married with Children and all of a sudden the Gary Shandling show was debuted and I watched all four seasons of that. And he actually was nominated for an Emmy the first season they did that. Sorry there's not much to show but at some point this whole wall here I'm sure will be taken down. So Gary once again got tired of doing something repetitive and ended up finishing up the show, ended up leaving the Gary Shandling show or it's Gary Shandling show and eventually would go on to start doing the Larry Sanders show. Now kind of what prompted that was the leaving of David Letterman. He was going to be leaving his late night 1230 slot and they offered that slot to Gary Shandling. They also auditioned Conan O'Brien and they decided to give it to Gary. Now once Gary 
thought about it, he said, I don't want to do something that's repetitive. I don't want to have a scheduled thing every single day. He liked working on a show that was once a week or something that he could really develop as an art and just didn't want to have a scheduled thing, you know, like a basically, like I said, like an everyday thing. He just said that wasn't his personality. So he turned that down. They gave that to Conan, but he did say to himself, maybe I wouldn't like to host my own show every night, but maybe what I would like to do is make a show about a guy who hosts a late night show and go into all the uh, interpersonal relationships behind the scenes, you know, with the guests, how the guests truly feel about Larry and how the employees all work off of Larry and, and just all those things. And that's what Larry Sanders was all about. And Larry Sanders was an absolute freaking hit. It's one of the greatest shows, in my opinion, that's ever come out. And so many shows now have really mimicked not only that idea, but it's Gary Shandling's show with the talking to the camera back and forth and really bringing the audience into it. Gary was, in this generation, really the, the guy to do that in television that everyone has kind of copied since. So sadly, in 2016, this property was put up for sale, or apparently was listed for sale, right before Gary unexpectedly died. He, at the age of 66, had a heart attack here at his home. And it's weird to think of because this was his sanctuary. He, in the mid 80s, he had had a, a really bad car accident. He was getting out of a car and another car sideswiped and hit him. And he had a whole life changing moment where he actually had a voice ask him if he wanted to continue living or if he wanted to die while he was in the hospital. You know, like a, something from a different place. Let's put it that way is how, he, he rarely talked about it. But ever since then, he got into transcendental meditation and Buddhism and would spend, you know, almost every show before he would do any performance, he said he would meditate just to not to get into his character, the exact opposite, to get closer to Gary. And so he ended up having this as his retreat from 1990 until he passed away, so 26 years. And this is where he would do a lot of his writing, but this is also where he had that untimely heart attack and died. Now I'd read online that Gary had um, throughout his life battled like a hyperthyroid. And so he had had surgeries on that at um, over at Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. And so uh, that makes you prone to heart attacks apparently. And Gary was in great shape. Like I said, he meditated a lot. He was in great health and was a pretty healthy eater from what I read everyone else say. And unfortunately, you know, he passed at the age of 66, but one of the bright things that came out of that, I read online was that he ended up donating $15 million of his estate to UCLA Medical Center. Now after Gary passed, they had a giant celebration. All of his friends were there, Johnny Depp and Billy Crystal, Warren Beatty, and it was all hosted by Judd Apatow who interviewed Gary when Judd was like in high school and ended up reconnecting with him later and then would become one of his writers. One of his first jobs, Judd's first job was helping to write jokes for the Emmys when Gary hosted. And then they would also become great friends and he would write and direct a lot of uh, the Larry Sanders show. They had this big celebration in Gary's, in honor of Gary's life. But I also read that in the actual funeral, they wanted to have a traditional Buddha ceremony. So uh, they had a monk there that ordained Gary a monk and shaved the circle on his head and, um, and said last rites for him there. Such a big fan of Gary Shandling. There's a great, and I should mention also, there's a fantastic uh, documentary out there that Judd Apatow did um, on the, the Zen notebooks of Gary Shandling. It was really amazing how many different people were inspired by Gary Shandling or got their start with him, including Sam Simon, who did a lot of The Simpsons, like one of the creators of The Simpsons. And all of those people, like I mentioned, Gary had a, uh, they said you took a path and then down the hill on this one acre property, five bedroom house in fact, um, that you would take this little path down and there was a basketball court down there that uh, Gary was constantly out there playing and like I said it was called the Fight Club. It was, you know, you never talked about 
anything business related. You could make jokes and everything. Obviously, that's what it was for, was to come and hang out and blow off steam and whatever. But they said originally, um, Gary used to do his writing sessions for the Larry Sanders show out here with Judd. And then once they wrapped it up, he decided those basketball games now would be no business talk. It would just be come out, play the game, have fun, joke around, and not talk about it until the next game. Well, unless they decide to rebuild it, I'm not guessing they're gonna do that just by looking at you know, some of the damage to it. And this was sold in, I believe 2016, it's now 2020 and it's in this condition with all the other houses around it being up for demolition. Kind of wondering if the same person didn't buy all of these properties up here in this cul-de-sac, but I guess it's fitting that if they're gonna demolish it, they should because Gary had it built. This was his inner sanctum and no one else should be there afterward. And to my knowledge, there is no grave to Gary Shandling anywhere, not in Tucson, not here. Um, I believe he was cremated, but other than that, I'm not sure, you know, what ended up happening to his ashes or if he has a final memorial for fans to go visit. So I decided I wanted to come and check this out now while, you know, while it's still here, even though we couldn't see a whole lot. So other than getting into comedy when he was a kid after his brother died that helped him get through everything, it was also ham radio. Gary got so into ham radio that he would basically be on there talking to people every single day and he loved it because that way he could, you know, get to know different people's personalities that he never was meeting. He said it was a real eye-opener in personal relationships and just personal behavior. Well, my friends, we're gonna call it a day. I can't recommend the comedy of Gary Shandling enough. All the shows that he did, well, both of them, I guess you'd say. But also, he did something really funny. It was called The Gary Shandling Show 25th Anniversary, and it was a fake 25th anniversary show where they made up all these old clips, and Johnny Carson even did a little cameo on it. It's really, really funny. You can find it on YouTube. Go watch that if you'd like to check him out as well. Just wanted to uh, thank everyone for watching and thank you Rebecca G, Sir Birkenbill, Cordell, Chester Cook, Matthew Edward Kent, Janice Chambers, and Kimberly Jolly for becoming my newest Patreons. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you all again. Goodbye.